Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. I have a special guest today. Uh, he's a former field construction and service contractor, Jack O'Neill. Jack, welcome to the show. Hi, Sam. Good to be with you. Okay. Uh, now, Jack, I recently posted a podcast about electric cars and the environmental problems that they potentially can bring. And this is a perfect segue to go into a topic about oil and gas, and you're just the person I want to speak to because you have many years of experience. And I want you to give me a framework of how important uh, this valuable substance really is, the oil and gas, what it does, not just for cars, for fuel, diesel, airplanes, uh, plastics, cosmetics. I mean, it's such an important substance. And they're just saying, oh, convert to EVs, renewables, you know, that's going to That'll, that'll solve the problem of fossil fuels, right? And CO2 that's coming from humans that it's, that's causing climate change. So please address those things. Yeah, um, well, that's a pretty, uh, pretty tall order to address. Uh, but having grown up in the oil and gas business, uh, I have family members who are the top of, uh, B, who were involved at the top of BP, US oil companies, worked with Exxon, British Petroleum, uh, Arco, Conoco, we've done a lot of construction and uh, development. I've been involved with that around the world. But my, uh, I do have family members too, they're involved politically with this and, and good friends have been doing this for roughly 40 years. Um, and you're right, people don't understand, they don't really comprehend to the degree that the whole world runs on oil. Uh, of course, it runs fuel, we run, it's, and it's not just oil, it's not petroleum, it's not just the gas we put in our cars to drive around. Uh, oil and gas industry, of course, is everything, it's, it's plastics, it's heating oil, it's uh, chemicals, fertilizer, everything. Every part of your life, everything that you do is entwined with oil. And beyond that, you you've also have the world hegemonic trade, banking, uh, the U.S. dollar, uh, everything runs, it's, it's based on oil. And if, if you decouple, once you start to decouple segments of the economy, segments of production, you, well, once you start to separate segments of production, oil, gas, you, you, then be, you then begin to decouple the economy, the flow of dollars, politics, with predictable and unpredictable consequences. The point I was also trying to bring out in the podcast mm -hmm. is that Rockefeller, when he started Standard Oil, right? Right. He, he didn't need any government subsidies, right? I mean, he didn't need tax credits for the oil industry. When this was like during the Industrial Revolution, I mean, oil was the major huh. drive during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, you have people like David Rockefeller, I and mean, he didn't need government subsidies. This was laissez-faire back then. There was no mm -hmm. government involvement in the economy to speak of. So basically, to make the oil industry work, you just need a demand, extreme, extreme demand. We're talking about the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and they right. have all the products that oil had back then, which is like quite small to what they use oil now, right? It, it's, it got so much bigger and it doesn't require subsidies because there's demand for it. It's that mm -hmm. simple. Then you take uh, Andrew Carnegie, right? Another mm -hmm. robber baron. The steel industry. Did he need government subsidies? No, of course not. I mean, that was the, that was the time of the beginning of you know, rail, right? That was the age of rail. Right. Other things that required steel, like all the skyscrapers that came up. Remember, I mean, I, I was reading about like the Empire State Building, you know, how much steel they had to bring just to put up that building alone it was incredible how much they needed <laughs> well, what, you know, you know what and saying? what made that possible what made that possible, made it possible Sam, it was demand. Oil. It's, it's demand well it was oil you, oh, you yeah, couldn't have, yes yes well what came first the chicken or the egg well exactly, when yes. oil was discovered that's when demand came they said hey we've got all these things we can do you can have cars you can have skyscrapers you can have these things with the world has never seen before Agriculture too, oil and gas industry, that's brought, what came out of that was fertilizer. The yeah. agricultural industry, the, the world couldn't have supported 
the number of people we have today at anything period not to mention that the lifestyle we do today without oil everything yeah, is predicated a, on oil yeah that that that's a great point you just made a great point because all the other things i mentioned are so important like steel right uh mm -hmm. like vanderbilt you know he, he had the transportation industry well how do you have transportation oil right <laughs> you know all the things all these robber baron uh inventions like you know henry ford how, how are those cars how are those cars powered oil and, and i made the point in my podcast that people think that converting from internal combustion engines to electric cars is a progression i'm like no it's not because electric cars actually predated internal combustion engine cars by about 50 years so converting to evs won't be a progression it will be a regression I mean, the opposite. I mean, those things didn't work back then and they're not working too great now, you know? Well, I would say, Sam, when you say it's a regression, I, I think that's true. Um, what, where, where the disconnect seems to come with this whole electric car phenomenon is that it's energy, it's BTUs. This is what moves things. Uh, when you look at an electric car, uh, and I've worked in power generation, done some electrical engineering. And this is the, this is the point that I made that, that came to mind 20, 30 years ago in the oil, the, in the oil and gas industry. It's some friends of mine who were petroleum and basically energy engineers. They said, when you look at this, um, how efficient is an automobile? An automobile, when you burn gasoline, you put it in your car, you convert roughly 20 to, it could be up to 40%, if you have a hybrid car, of the energy that you produce moves that car down the road. So you take that source energy, came out of the ground, could be natural gas, could be gasoline. 20 to 40% 20 to of that energy that's in that tank of gas, that gallon of gas, is converted into energy to move your car down the road. Now, in an electric car, roughly, you know, 60% of that energy that you put into that battery goes to move that car down the road. But what did it take to produce that, that energy to charge that battery? Well, first of all, if you, in, in the U.S., we generate most of our electricity from natural gas and coal. Let's say you take well, natural well, what, gas. What about from, nuclear? That's 25%. That's a lot right there. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 25%, but still the majority of elect for most of the country, the majority of like here on the West Coast, the majority of our electricity is produced by gas. You know, not sure to change the subject, uh, Jack, but I, I would like to, mm -hmm. I'd like you to touch on a, a little bit since we're talking about energy, uh, what you think about nuclear power, because uh, recently in New York here, they mm -hmm. they shut down the Indian Point power plant. I don't know if you're a proponent right. of that or you just basically don't have a position on it. Yeah, I don't, um, you know, out here in the West Coast, we had several nuclear power plants that were shut down. Um, they say primarily for safety issues. Um, nuclear has a problem with the, it, it's centralized and it's expensive because it's basically done upon, it, it's predicated on government. It's mm -hmm. not like you would say robber baron. So what happens, it becomes astronomically expensive. It becomes politicized it's 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 impractical on a lot of now when you say expensive you mean the initiation phase you know when they first have to build well it. the construction yeah exactly. it's construction once it's here it's, it's cheap right you know once it it can be cheap yeah it, it can be if you look at france um you know their mm -hmm. their nuclear yeah. power industry is pretty successful but yeah. they don't they don't use light water <clears throat> reactors they 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 employ a lot of breeder reactors so they're actually manufacturing fuel there's some safety and some other issues you know nuclear weapons things like that that issues that are that are becoming a political hotbed but there are the technology i think sam is out there to produce when you really look at this um efficient nu you know fissionable nuclear power can be very it could be affordable it could be readily implementable it could be safe quote safe um i think the problem lies it's it's a political 
issue rather than a technical but issue. You, but you think power. it shouldn't be political, right? You think it should just let no, I No, it shouldn't be political. Yeah. It, you, you have to have some regulatory bodies, but I think that if you have, if you have a public body that is, runs independent of industry, the people who are making the profits and you have an, and government who are using that for profit and power, I think you can come up with some pretty, I would expect you could come up with some pretty viable nuclear power options. It could probably, and, and that's what you need on, in a system. You need this base load. You need a large, something to provide a large base load to have a successful economy. You can have a yeah. diffuse, <clears throat> it, the power, it, you need that that for industry. You need that large base load for industry. Yeah, we can offset a lot of things with conservation, renewables. You can you can you can power your house. You can turn on your lights. Yeah, I I, I understand more. what you're saying, but I I don't think the government should uh, regulate anything. Uh, I think well, I think that I, yeah. I understand what you're saying, but uh, government regulation just causes problems because right. But said, you have you go a back public. to the Robert Barron days. Mm -hmm. You have Carnegie, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, Ford. There were no regulations, zero, no regulations at all. And, and look how yeah. much prosperity this country had. I mean, you had real sustainable jobs, high paying jobs, skilled work, uh, a good work ethic. Uh, it, it, it's great, just keep the government out of it. I mean, how do you think yeah. that the West, which you are from now, right? How do you mm -hmm. think that the West was even, even discovered? I mean, when Greeley said, go West, right? What did he say? He said, go west on your own. I mean, you think they were going to have like, you know, this massive push west with covered wagon, right. and all the fighting Indians and all that stuff. If, if you had social security tax, and <laughs> tax <laughs> subsidies and credit, all, all this stuff <laughs> the government imposes on people, you have to give away half of your income. America would we have an discovery, you know? Would we have an America or a modern world today? Well, no, you, you probably wouldn't. You would have, you, you would have something probably like, um, a failed Soviet state or something. You, you wouldn't. We wouldn't have what we had today if, if if everything was predicated on government. That's what I'm trying to say. It's just that you know they, like I said here, this power plant that they had, it was shut down because it was all political. It's like, oh, it's not safe. It's 50 miles away from Times Square, and it's, they were trying to build up this fair, this fair mongering and everything. And then when they close it, the bills have skyrocketed. Because they can't meet that shortfall. Well, I think a quarter. Why? Why is that? Why have your? Why is your electric bills skyrocketed after? Well, they've skyrocketed. Years? First of all, th there's two reasons why. And this was on the news recently. I don't know which power plant you use, but here I don't know if you heard of Con Edison. Yeah, uh, that's the main one that they have here in New York. It's, it's maybe one, maybe the biggest, one of the biggest uh, suppliers of, of power. It's a utility company. Of course, they have to buy public it. utilities. The PUC. Yeah, they have to buy the energy. Some of the some of it they produced. I think some of it they actually produced in Indian Point. And uh, they were getting a lot of cheap energy. I heard most of it, most of the energy coming from that power plant alone was running the New York City subway system. I mean, that's a lot of energy. Really? Yes. Really? <laughs> it was <laughs> very, very efficient, very cheap. It takes a very little space. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not far from Peekskill, New York, which is basically upstate. It's, it's pretty close by. Uh, it, it, it was a tremendous amount of energy, a very low cost. Uh, the people that were running the plant were saying, you know, don't close this thing. It, it's not a good idea. And uh, they, they shut that down. And guess what? They said, oh, well, you know, we have a segue because we could move over to, guess what? Natural gas. When they shut this yeah. plant down, natural gas was cheap, right? So you can convert to natural gas. Con Edison was using that. The bills yeah. were still somewhat low. Compared to when well, that's what's... Power yeah, and Sam, that's... When they had the power plant open. But guess what happened? Now they have the war in Russia, right? <laughs> natural yeah. gas prices have exploded. And now electric bills here are up 300% or more. Well, and, and that, that you bring up a good well. point. Because you're not in... To have a, a stable, viable economy, you not only have to have the stable base load of energy, yeah. That energy also has to be at a stable price point, a stable and predictable price point. That's the thing about nuclear power and nuclear energy. That price point can be projected out a couple of decades, and it's probably going to remain pretty much the same. When you start basing your economy on these volatile commodities, things like oil and gas that are subject to political, uh, environmental, you know, it's hegemonic issues, yeah, then you're going to have an... Your, your power See, base. That's another, you know what it is, Jack? That's another failure mm -hmm. of government. 
Sure. I don't want to get too much into this. We could do this on a different uh, show, but sure. the government should have never gotten involved in that war. I mean, if they just invaded Ukraine, you mm -hmm. have one oligarchy fighting another oligarchy, right? Let them roll in. Right. But what do the neocons have to do? They got to send weapons there, fuel mm -hmm. this war, right? Cause all this destruction. And that's what caused the price of natural gas to spike. If they didn't get involved, if NATO well, didn't get involved, the price would have been stable and this wouldn't have happened. So not only they shut down Indian Point, that was a government action, right? Mm -hmm. Then right. they get involved by sending weapons to Ukraine, which is prolonging this war, which is still going on now. Right. It's a horrific war. Terrible. The casualties there are horrible. It's very, very bad. And this is the fault of government. It's the fault of the West. And this is what's causing the energy to go up. So you see, it's always government. I mean, it's amazing. It's always government. I mean, you know something? Uh, Isaac Newton, right? Right. When he was able to... Uh, he, they called it junk science. You know, he's this great scientist. He, he invented calculus and, and gravity, the idea of gravity. And then he comes up with this alchemy, right, which is junk science. Mm -hmm. Like he wants to convert uh, lead into gold. Mm -hmm. At least he tried. You know, the government succeeds by turning <laughs> gold into lead. I mean, everything <laughs> they touch, they destroy. It, it's incredible. I mean, they just ruin everything. Everything just to stay out of it. And, 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 and this, is, this is my point here. It's the same thing with this electric car conversion nonsense. Mm -hmm. I mean, they want to convert, take a, a viable, thriving transportation system that runs on oil, runs on natural gas. Uh, there's other sources of fuel, by the way, as we know, ethanol, hydrogen. I think there's about 13,000 hydrogen-powered mm -hmm. vehicles in the United States. Yeah. Well, that you've got to have the... That's yeah. The hydrogen becomes an energy transport medium. Yeah. It's not an energy source of it in and of itself. I understand, so, but it's still a fossil fuel. Yeah. Right? It's, it comes from right. Fossil. Well, it, it would be yeah. It would have it's derived from. It could be derived from solar, whatever. It's a transport medium. It's like an electric wire. The hydrogen is like the electric cable that you come to charge your car, or the hose you put in your the fuel line that you put in the yeah, back. But, of but your they're car against that car. too. You know, they, they're, they're not like it's because it's, yeah, it's derived from fossil and, fuels. These vehicles that require massive subsidies. I mean, I mentioned in my podcast before that you compare the cheapest electric car to the cheapest uh, uh, gasoline powered car, and it, it's much, much higher as far as electric, uh, as far as the electric car. And even with the subsidy, mm -hmm. you're still paying more. So, you know, it's not even... Yeah, you're, you're, you're and, paying and, more, and, and yeah. you're going to pay more <laughs> for electricity in the future, and, uh, and your cost to drive that electric car my prediction would be that it's it's going to be more per mile than what you're paying currently with gasoline. And you know, this also basically drives the the entry level consumer out of the market. The ice engine industry has a very vibrant used car market. There's more used cars to sell by far than there are new cars on the market. Mm -hmm. So most people that are in the entry level uh, situation to buy a car they're buying a used car they're not buying a new one it's too expensive mm -hmm. and you can get a lot of great used cars i could just tell you right now i mean i would say up until the early part of the 2000s mid 2000s mm -hmm. general motors of all companies you know a company that's faced a lot of adversity mm -hmm. it's really it's gone bankrupt already mm -hmm. they made some fantastic vehicles i worked on them. very good mm -hmm. vehicles strong reliable cars I mean, for example, a Series 3, uh, 3,800, 3.8 mm -hmm. V6. This mm -hmm. engine was an old pushrod design, cast iron block. I mean, you could run this engine four or 500,000 miles. I mean, durable, really well-made vehicle all around, easy to service. I mean, the, the radiator, chick chock, you could just take it right out. You have your coil packs right in the front. Water pump is right there, right in front of you. Alternator is right in front of you. I mean, the ease of maintenance. This is the way a car should be built. You're in and out of the shop in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. and you're back on the road, right? I mm -hmm. mean, this car could be handed down generations. I mean, if it's kept clean, if you're not in a rust belt like here, yeah. which is another function of government, destroying the roads with all this brine. My mm -hmm. point is you have a very vibrant automotive industry. And, and this is good for the environment. When you keep a car on the road for a long time and it doesn't end up in a landfill, that's environmentally friendly. And I, I've got a, 
I've got a Toyota here. What is a, it's oh. a 2003 model, and it's got 400 and a little over 400,000 miles what on it. What kind of Toyota V6. is that? It's an old Sienna minivan that oh, I bought yeah. with 100,000 miles on it years ago. And I used it for a business, you know, the write off. You get 50, you write off 50 cents a mile. So I used it as a business write off. Bought the thing for $1,800 with 100,000. So it's wow. a high end. It was a nice rig. And uh, it was a recovery car, so I got it cheap, you know. And uh, so I used it as a write-off, as a business write-off. I've, I've worn out. I've had two other new cars since then. I had a new Dodge truck and I had a new Ford. Both of those things in that period of time, within within 100,000 miles, they were they were unmaintainable. This thing, I've spent almost nothing on it in 400,000 miles. And it's still running. And it gets yeah. close to 30 miles to the gallon. Um I, I've worked so on I've them. Got, I, I know the, the only uh, thing with those is that they're they're excellent. It's yeah. just that you have you do have a timing yeah. belt on it, not a timing chain. Right. I've had this one replaced twice yeah. on this one. So, okay, yeah. so you know what you're doing. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And besides, yeah. it's a non-interference engine. You know, Toyota is very. Yeah, strong. if it busts, it's, it's you're. Yeah, you can just you just re, you you get a tow and replace. That's why I'm running it now. I think I've got two hundred thousand miles on the belt, and I'm I'm just going to run it till the belt breaks, and then I'll have a tow and put another belt on it. There's no. They don't put that brine all over the road. Um, we don't have brine. We don't use ice. Cars last forever here. Yeah. Um, I don't see any reason for I've always questioned that in East Coast. Why do they use salt and brine on these roads? It just, it, it caused, I, I always assumed it was kind of a planned obsolescence tool. But it, it's in New York, it's a union thing. You know, basically, ah, they, they, sense, they, yeah. the salt companies make the money by uh, distributing the salt. And, and then the road repair companies uh, make money when they destroy the roads. But sure. if they they will right. they're having a party. But the people that lose are the, are the people that own the cars because it destroys. The well, yeah. and, and that's it. I mean, I I've, I've driven the new Teslas. I have friends that have bought these cars, but these are high high wealth individuals. There is no way I could afford. I can't. I, there's no new car that I could afford to to buy at this point. And and it wouldn't make sense even if it did a used car. That's what I need. If if I had to buy a new car, I would be in, I would be in worse poverty than I am now. I mean, well, listen, I, you have a Toyota. No you you obviously know what you're doing. You you you're driving right now, uh, a company that's considered the crown jewel of quality in automobiles. I mean, the Toyota yeah. is as good as it gets. It wasn't always like that, but it is now. They they make the well, best you know vehicles what? on the road. And I don't drive much. And I used to drive a lot for business. I don't do much now. And uh, with and getting older, need to exercise. I've uh, I've built built some of these, built several of these electric bikes, some custom electric bikes. And you know, I I one the most enjoyment I've ridden. I think it was about a thousand miles last year. I rode on an electric bike that I built. It's kind of like a motorcycle. It'll get up to forty miles an hour if I need to. I've had more fun with that. And I just enjoy driving it, uh, uh, riding that damn thing. I hardly, hardly used my car all summer with this thing. Um, and I think that we can, I think that, you know, when you talk about electric cars, we're working on a design with some, um, I'm working on a design with some people for a kind of a, a very light mobility unit. And I think for electric cars, these big battleship electric cars, they make no sense. But if you've got a small, efficient electric vehicle, um, something you can charge from a wall socket. It's five, six, five, six, seven thousand dollars. Like some of these electric, these little electric commuter cars you're seeing in Europe. For a lot of people, that makes a lot of sense. If you just need to run to the store, you need to go down to the end of the block, you plug, the, I, I love that, the bike. I got to start the car up, I got to back it, I got to put the seat belt on. I just open the garage door, wheel electric bike, flip the switch on, bam, I'm going, I'm having fun, I'm getting exercise. It's like riding a motorcycle, but better. And I think, you know, and having a light electric vehicle, I think those make a lot of sense. But to replace all of everything that we're driving, everything we're doing, this used car market, disrupt the whole economy. And once you start disrupting a, a small portion of the economy, it, it's, it's going to have a ripple effect that, that can, could severely, it could damage the whole world economy. This is, in my opinion, it's madness what's, what's happening here. Um, I think there's some safe and sane, reasonable, economically viable alternatives, things that electric power can be used for. But this agenda of replacing uh, all of our fleet uh, with electric vehicles, everything we're driving, uh, it's self-destructive. 
Well, as I mentioned also, you know, I was doing some more research. I found out that mm -hmm. you know, these batteries can't even be recycled. They say to take these things apart is so yeah. labor intensive to separate the metals. Yeah, they can't. And, and then oh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an environmental hazard. It's yeah, a yeah, exactly. So, now so you think about it, after the battery is done, when the battery is spent already, it's like in your phone it is, and your laptop, these batteries are everywhere. It's hazardous yeah, waste. You, you I mean, can't, can you, you, can't the, take, you can't even take them apart no. because they're, they're so expensive to, no. to, to, to recycle. It's just, it's more cost effective just to mine new ones. So where do all these massive well, batteries end up? They end up in a landfill. And by the way, I heard that if they put mm -hmm. these things in a landfill, you know, they can explode. It, it, sure. These are very well, hazardous and, and, and you look That's at another environmental it's, it's disaster. Cobalt. It's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Very dangerous. You've got lithium. You've got cobalt. Two of the most toxic metals <laughs> we we use. That's the that's what those batteries are made of. Now there's some more. There will probably be more environmentally friendly batteries. You can look at lithium iron phosphate batteries. They're a lot better. They last longer. Um, they're less expensive to build, but they don't get around the, the simple fact, Sam, that. You're, you're using energy. And, and for most of the U.S., like here in the West, how, are, how do we power electric cars? We power them with natural gas. So you maybe 20% of the power is going to come from renewables, solar, whatever. But the majority of what's going into that to power that electric car comes from natural gas. Well, when you burn that natural gas, at the most, you might convert maybe 50% of it to energy, but typically 30% in a natural gas power plant. So 30, that's the same as the car. If you took that natural gas and you burned it in your car, you would be the same efficiency as what's burned at the nuclear at, at your at your gas generating plant. Well, out of that, when you trans when you transmit that power to the grid, you have to go through a transformer. You lose ten to twenty percent. That's just simple physics and heat right through that transformer. That's going out the window. So you just lost twenty percent you're going to lose another 8 to 20% in transmission losses. So you lost 40% of that. Then when it gets to your house, it's got to go through another transformer. You just lost another 10 to 20% through the heat in that transformer. So now you've got the charger. You lose another 10%. When you get that down, the, the original amount of energy typically, when you generate at the, at the source at a, at a gas-fired power plant, only about maybe 10 to 20% of that energy that you generate, that, that, that natural gas, that CO2 that you generated, all that power, only by the time it gets into your, the battery of your car, maybe 20% of it got there at best. Then that electric car, you lose another 10 to 20% the, through the battery and the efficiency of the motor. Yeah, 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 it's, it's, it's less it's, efficient. It's less efficient. Yeah. We did a thing, Sam, years ago when I was working for the oil companies. We did a pilot project in, in Texas and Arizona. And what we did was we took natural gas, because they were trying to shut these, these oil refineries down for environmental reasons. And the, and the, and the oil companies were scared. That we got to come up with an alternative. So they came up with a... It was a refined natural gas liquid, kind of like butane, similar but heavier, like what you would use in your lighter fluid or something. But it was a densified, kind of like a densified butane. And uh, that stuff, it would require very little modification. You could burn it in a, in a, in a car. It was like 130 octane. It burned as clean as natural gas. Uh, but the main thing was is that it was almost non-polluting when you refined it. It took less energy. Uh, they figured that you could produce this fuel for the same amount of BTUs as, as oil for about 30% of the cost. So there was a huge profit margin, you know, potential there for the oil companies. It was environmentally friendly. Um, you could produce, we didn't have to rely on foreign oil. We could produce all of our energy needs here. Um, but that was shut down. Now that sort of a technology makes much more sense to convert to something like that would make much more sense than an electric vehicle. And when you look at hybrid vehicles versus uh, just gasoline engines, or you look at electric cars, the hybrid vehicles, by a lot of estimates, is, is more, it, it has a less of a CO2 footprint, and it, it maintains- And they're more the serviceable. It's more efficient. I mean, you, could, you can change the yeah. batteries in those much more- You don't have all this huge, this huge amount of batteries. So the, the hybrid- no, It's not vehicle, just that. You could, the battery is changeable. It, it, it's, it's still dangerous. Yeah. You, have to have a, you have to have a professional mm -hmm. to do it, but it's quick. It's right. not so difficult uh, to change that battery. Yeah. And an electric car, that's not it's, part you know, of it. It's sealed into the car. You can't even get it out. 
it, it's yeah. and so this in. Is, it's because it's it's dangerous. It's very very uh, volatile. So they have to encase it in metal, and there's a cooling system that goes in there. It's I'm telling you, there'll be no used car market whatsoever. It'll be to totally destroyed. Mechanics won't be well. They're disposable, there. and this is serviceability. What we see the whole in computers. They, they don't understand else. the vibrancy of the automotive industry is the used car market. You take that away, you mm -hmm. have no automotive industry anymore. Yeah, no one is going to buy a, 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 a used electric car. I mean, if they do, they're going to pay down for it. It's, it's going to be a very small market because how do you know what's left on the battery? The battery is most of the value of the car, right? Right. Well, I think batteries are going to improve, but it's still... Yeah, but they, uh, listen, they, that's what they say. It's going to improve, but they've been around for like over 160 years. I keep, when is it going to improve? Well, it's still less than 1% well, of the U.S. auto fleet. I mean, come on. It's 2023. Sure. And it's not even one percent of the auto fleet, and already they're well, facing environmental disasters in Africa, mining this stuff. It's just they have to come up with a different battery or something. But don't talk about it like well, these politicians. Well, say, and, well, you know, we're going to get there in twenty uh, thirty-five, and they come up with these crazy, mm -hmm. you know, forecasts. Like you might as well say that there's going to be, you know, forget about cars. There'll be a, a Star Trek teleporter, you know, to transport yeah. people. Right. That's a good. So just say it. You know, say it straight out. And there's going to be a Star Trek teleporter. You know, that's what they say. See, when Henry Ford said, when he made a, a, a forecast that they're going to uh, go from horse and carriage to car, he had his assembly line. It was the blink of an eye. It was, it was ready to go right there and then. It was present. There were no forecasts. It might happen. Government subsidies. You know, whenever you see this, you know it's not going to work. That's right. what I'm trying to say. Well, and I think, Sam, that when, and over the whole time, you have to look at what is the impetus for this switch from gasoline to electric. What, what's the impetus for that? CO2 emissions, climate change, right? Yeah. This is, so you've got to look at that. Is, that. is that real or not? Well, I encourage everybody to really look at that and not just the propaganda, but the, the real science behind it and not the science you're being fed. Um, if you go to EPA, if you go to... Uh, you know, sources of greenhouse gas emissions. This is from EPA. It's on their website. Got a whole page to this. They break down sources of uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, by economic sector in 2020. Transportation is 27%, electric power 25, industry 25, 24%, commercial residential 13, agriculture 11%. Transportation, and this is everything. This is, this encompasses Air transport, rail, all transportation, electric cars, I mean, 27%. Now, by switching to, a, even with renewables, um, if you switch the whole fleet, what are these electric cars? I'll sum this up. How much by switching to electric cars can we offset this greenhouse gas emissions? Maybe 20%, 15%, maybe. And that's only 27%. So you're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions totally by three or 4% and you're going to disrupt everything. Does that make sense? No, I don't think it does. It's not just You're that. talking 20, a quarter of, of total greenhouse gas emissions. You're talking about affecting maybe 10 or 15% of a quarter of green, of, of a quarter of total greenhouse gas emissions. What does that do for us? It does nothing. As far as human caused global warming, such as increased uh, greenhouse gases that are emitted from humans. Of course, there's a lot of other CO2 sources that come from animal waste and leaves. And they say most of it comes from the ocean. But there are actually respected scholars in the climate science field that question and argue that humans are not causing increased warming of the planet. I mean, I can quote some here. Is global warming real? I don't believe that human CO2 is causing that warming. Professor Tim Ball, University of Winnipeg Department of Climatology. Here's another one. We can't say that CO2 will drive climate. It certainly never did in the past. Professor Ian Clark, Department of Earth Sciences, University of Ottawa. Everyone who goes around and says that carbon dioxide is responsible for most of the warming of the 20th century, hasn't looked at the basic numbers. Professor Patrick Michaels, Department of Environmental Sciences, University of Virginia. I mean, so, I mean, to say that this is not a disputed science is not knowing the facts. There's a lot of respected scholars in this field that dispute mm -hmm. that humans are causing the planet to warm. So how could you take a disputed science 
to basically unravel and destroy the entire transportation industry. I mean, they're, they're telling you, they're basically telling you, okay, EVs, it may not be the answer, uh, but you know, think of what you're doing for the planet, right? You're preventing the planet from, uh, from warming and, and people are gonna drown and there's gonna be floods everywhere. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's unbelievable. I mean, how could, they, how could they get away with something like this? Well, they get away with it because they bought, they bought the narrative. You can buy in politics, industry, wherever you are. If you've got the money, you can buy whatever science you want that says whatever it says. And then if you have the propaganda machine, you can funnel that through there. You create a meme and a narrative and you brainwash your audience. Whatever demographic, it could be the whole world. You can brainwash them. You can with, with that. And we have an agenda here that's being pushed. It's not based in logic or science or what's best for this. It's based in what's best for this new global agenda, this new world economy that, that they're trying to shove down our throat. So and when, when you look at this data, Sam, um, note that this one narrative, this, this man-made climate change narrative, it's not questionable. You can't question it. And it's pushed by a very small, narrow group of individuals that are being paid by this group of elites, these, this group of people, this agenda. When you look at the dissenters on this, they're decentralized. They are not centralized. They are decentralized. It was like what we saw with this recent pandemic. The, the centralized experts had one narrative, and it was unquestionable. Then you had the decentralized experts, the ones that were in it. They were saying something completely different. They were silenced. And in the end, it's looking more, up more, as time, more and more as time goes by. We see these uh, the decentralized experts. It's going to come very soon that they're just going to have to reverse course. I mean, as I explained in the podcast, there's already massive environmental disasters going on in the Republic of the Congo. They're destroying natural habitat forests, the slave labor. I mean, all this is going on to extract this lithium and cobalt. And you have under 1% of the 250 million vehicle fleet in the United States, which is EVs. And already you see this going on. There's right. a pushback in Portugal where they have this in Chile. I mean, this is all over the world. They're mining lithium. And this is not some cutesy little laptop battery or cell phone battery. These batteries weigh a ton. They're huge. They're monstrously big. And I mean, to get all this material and under 1%, let's say it gets to 2%. It's not even 1%. Let's say it's 2%. That's double, right? What you have now. That's an order of magnitude of 100% more lithium that has to be extracted, right? That's just 2%. And they're talking about 50% by 2035. I mean, Jack, is that even possible? No, no, it's not. <laughs> I don't think by any, by anybody's estimate, and I think that when you look at look at this, um, this is a narrative. The, this whole electric vehicle climate change news, this this narrative that we're hearing, this is being used to push an agenda. And I saw this with with the oil companies when they had an, and and, poli and and in politics, when someone has an agenda you want to push, you come up with a narrative, whether it be true or not. You come up with it. You pitch it. And then once you get, once your agenda is achieved by use of this propaganda, this narrative, it goes away. And I think that's what you're going to see with whole, this whole electric car, uh, climate change, carbon. It, once they get changed, what they want changed, which is global hedge money, currencies, banking, debt. Once they get that structured and they get us where they want us, this whole thing's going to go away. It'll be something else. So when do you because think they're going to just start having to, I think they're going to start reversing course pretty soon. I think once they hit, if they can even get to 2% or 3% of the entire mm -hmm. fleet, I think they're going to start reversing course then. They're going to say, oh, well, this is not going to work. And it's just going to go, it's going to be back to internal combustion engines. And when I say back to it, I don't mean back to it. Because you got to understand, people don't understand that the, the internal combustion engine, despite how old it is, it's just, mm -hmm. you can't take it for granted. I've worked on these things. I mean, yeah. it's an amazing invention. It really is. 
it's it's not just that it can run on gasoline, it can run on ethanol, it can run on, you can run diesel, you could use cooking oil, you could use all kinds of fuels. I mean, natural gas, there's a lot of different fuels out there. Biodiesel, there's a lot mm -hmm. of different fuels that an internal combustion engine can run on. So it's mm -hmm. a very, very like flexible type of technology uh, that could run on different fuels while electric cars is just batteries. I mean, that's it. Well, the US, the US dollar runs, yeah, and Sam, and the U.S. dollar runs on on oil. Yeah, and and that's the thing. Once you, they can't do away with oil. I, I don't see how you can. Uh, this is a this is an interim geopolitical ploy, a strategy. This being employed, I believe, to destabilize the dollar. J just go look at the World Economic Forum. What what? Look at their plan. What they're saying it's it's not based in reality. It's it's smoke and mirrors. I just wanted to talk about the fact that they're going to have to reverse course, just like they've done in the past. Yeah. The cash for clunkers program. Imagine, I mean, what a disaster that was. And of course, when it comes to the so-called renewable energy, I don't even think it's renewable at all. Because what's renewable about it? I mean, you think these solar panels are set it and forget it? They need to be maintained. Wind turbines need to be maintained. I mean, as a mechanic, I know they have bearings, they have bushings and O-rings. These things need to turn all the time. I mean, they need to be maintained. It's not like mm -hmm. you're just going to build them and they're going to go on forever. I mean, look what happened in Texas, right, a few years ago, where they had that mm -hmm. massive problem with the with you know with the energy that the, the, the turbines weren't working or they got frozen because of the weather, the unexpected weather. I mean, you know, it, it just annoys me that these people that. They, they, they just come up with these crazy forecasts of conversion. Everything is going to be green, this, this green utopia, all this stuff. And, you know, they don't, it's not science-based. It's just pie in the sky political forecast because these people know by the time the forecast comes to the date, to the deadline, they're not even going to be in office anyway. It's going to be somebody else. So they're not going to take the blame to say, ah, you see, it didn't work. And, See that that's politics. That's how it works. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's the whole thing is going to. I predict they're going to have to reverse course uh, when this just gets to a few percentage points. Yeah, I, I think that. Yeah, and I don't know if it's even going to be even a reverse of course. They're just going to abandon the narrative. This will be abandoned in favor of something else. It's it's like Hegel's old dialectic, the thesis antithesis synthesis. You you theorize something. That, um, you create this animosity and this di you disruption, and then you gain power and control by offering this solution that isn't the solution. And and and, and, and the tragedy is that there's going to be so much money lost because you know you, that's what governments do. They throw good money after bad, and they distort the economy. So all the money that's being thrown mm -hmm. after this green energy and all the build-outs they have. I mean, look at Germany. I mentioned that on my podcast, what a waste mm -hmm. of money this is. It's not working for them. I mean, they're the mm -hmm. ultimate model. Think about it. I mean, they, they invented the automobile. Yeah. They invented rocket propulsion. It all came out of Germany. Yeah. And that's the country yeah. that has, that that's actually, ironically, the biggest experiment of renewables. Yeah. And it's failing. I mean, it's cool. Yeah, it was... down on stupid. They, they see it doesn't work there. And now they want to copy the same thing in the United States. I mean, are you kidding? It's... Uh, yeah, it's... And and that's where awareness is is key and it's central to this, Sam. It's it's what you're doing. It's what other lone wolves, these lone voices, are doing. Um, th that that's part of it. it. It's waking up in it. But I think even beyond that, it's it's understanding how these these fake narratives, this fake news, uh, works. And that might be something you want to chat about after after I left, quit the oil companies and. Um, what I saw there, I went to work for a large media network, uh, independent media network, and, and I worked a lot of years pretty hard to try to get out what I saw, what the abuses that in politics and in industry, uh, and, and how the how we as, as the people, the American public, are being played. Um, and, and we can look at all these little things, these all these these pie in the sky, these balloons, these toy balloons that are everywhere. We need this. We need that. There's something bigger at play. And, and there's an, there's an, it, it, it's, it's, it's questioning. It's truth. It's, it's getting at the truth and getting around these 
that this propaganda and, and this mind washing, I call it mind washing. It's not really brainwashing, it's mind washing. And and get to the truth because these the, the, this narrative and these these toy balloons that these people float in this propaganda. It can't survive the lie of truth. Most of these arguments can, and, and the stuff that this absurdities that they present, it can be deconstructed. Yeah, in a free few market minutes. forces win at the end. It's always like that. You look at the 2008 yeah. crisis, and as an economist, I can tell you, I mean, mm -hmm. free market forces win at the end. It's just a right. It creates this boom and bust cycle. The boom cycle reaches its peak, mm -hmm. then it turns into a bust cycle, and then you have all this pain and hardship that happens because it's the government that creates that boom, that artificial mm -hmm. high, that artificial yeah. buildup, which ordinarily in the free market wouldn't be there in the first place, yeah. and the bust wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And this is just right. another inflated uh, distortion that the government is getting involved in that's going right. to burst. And there's going to be a lot of industries that are going to feel a lot of pain, especially the solar industry and the wind turbine industry. It's, it's just when these things are, are figured out that they're not going to work as, as a baseload type of energy, uh, especially to power a power grid. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's failing and they keep doubling down on it and they keep throwing more money after it. Eventually it fails and, and that's going to be the end of it. Okay, so Jack, well, mm -hmm. leave it there. All right, Sam. Thank you for your time. It was it was great uh, chatting with you, and hopefully we could do it again sometime soon. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to chat here, Sam. Enjoy your work and uh, what you're doing there, and keep up with it. We need we need a whole army of guys like you out there. Thank you very much. Pleasure to speak to you. Take care.